Next up, we have a Goan artist from Toronto who believes that art is a foundation for healing and liberation. Sky's creative collaborations revolve around human connection, memory, grief, and hope. Please welcome Sky Lewis. <laughs> talking about decolonizing the future, yeah. question mark. <laughs> um, so decolonization is about identity and place, and my bio mentions that I'm going Torontonian. Toronto's up on the screen. Um, and most people know what I'm talking about when I say Toronto, but not everyone's heard of Goa. So Goa is a coastal part of India that was colonized by the Portuguese for about 500 years. And as someone who has roots in India and grew up here in Canada, the common thread for me between India and Canada is a shared history of European colonization and cultural imperialism. So I'm starting by talking about where I come from as a way of making the mechanics of colonization more visible. I'm gonna bounce back and forth between India and Canada with examples of some key elements of colonization and decolonization. So economics and governance, social and cultural systems, and concepts of human worth. And I'm also gonna highlight about how artists are helping to decolonize our minds and our imaginations and that's the good stuff. So in terms of economics, the colonization of India was originally focused on extracting mineral wealth. So if you think about the really big ass Koh-i-Noor diamond that's in the Queen of England's crown, that's from India. Um, and here in Alberta, we're more familiar with the extensive hunting of the buffalo. And something that I learned about um, more recently, um, which I think is fascinating, is that buffalo hide was used to drive the steam powered belts that powered the industrial revolution in England. So just the extent of the wealth that flowed from colonies back to the heart of these empires can't be underestimated. And that really supported their industrialization and modernization as world powers. So I just wanna sit with this image of the buffalo because it really speaks to the volume and intensity of the resource flows and how they've shaped the world that we're in now. So insert uncomfortable silence. <laughs> Um, so along with the loss of those resources, colonization also brings the destruction of systems of governance, economics, and societal institutions. So uh, up here we have the Portuguese Inquisition in Goa, which obliterated Hindu cultural practices there. And so for instance, they had a law where if you snitched on someone for having Hindu gods in their home, they would confiscate that person's home and then give you half of their wealth. So policies like this, of course, undermine social bonds with the explicit suppression of language, spiritual practices, and traditional land use. And so this staged photo is from Canada, um, and it was used to illustrate the supposed benefits of cultural suppression. So it was based on the concept that white European culture was superior to all others, and the idea was that if racialized people just assimilated to European standards, they'd be better off. And this came from Enlightenment Europe um, and this obsession with rationality and measuring and classifying, which I also love. Um, but unfortunately, they extended this to humans and tried to classify the humans of the world. And that led to a racial hierarchy, essentially, essentially saying that some people were primitive and inferior and stuck in the past. So in Canada, settler colonialism is justified by the myth that Canada was essentially empty and sparsely populated at the time of contact. So in other words, real history began with Europeans, and when the British and French arrived here, it was just an empty map and a blank slate. There's no one really here, and they weren't really making good use of the resources anyway. But of course, none of that is true. So those are some of the roots of colonization and the concepts and conditions that have shaped how we think and dream about the future. And so, so now I'm gonna to touch on some ways that artists and writers are turning both a critical and a hopeful lens on imagination and how we envision progress. So Afrofuturism, you may be familiar with, it's a stylish and colorful depiction of the future, so think Black Panther. Um, but it's more than a futuristic aesthetic, it's really about black liberation. So Adrienne Marie Brown, who's the person in the middle here, um, says that imagination is one of the spoils of colonization, which in many ways is claiming who gets to imagine the future for a given geography. And in her brilliant long form essay, a Report from Planet Midnight, sci-fi author Neil Hopkinson, who's up there, my artist crush, um, talks about how Western sci-fi deals with the concept of race. And she talks specifically about how often blue aliens stand in for blackness and other ways in which blackness and race are removed from stories about the future. And this is Hopkinson's book, Midnight Robber, featuring a black woman character who's explicitly black in the book. Um, but when the book was published in Italy, you can see the inset, um, the character was completely whitewashed. And this just illustrates how deeply seated some of these concepts are 
and how challenging it can be simply to imagine and depict racialized people in the future. So along with Afrofuturism, we have Indigenous Futurism. So Lindsay Catherine Cornham, who's on the right, not Matthew McConaughey, um, <laughs> has some amazing writing about space Indians, uh, critiquing the idea of endless expansion and progress, and the way that sci-fi celebrates the idea of colonizing and consuming new planets. A lot of Indigenous Futurism and Afrofuturism focuses on the idea of self-determination. So that's Janelle Monet, who you may know. Um, the Arch Android album is a beautiful representation of this concept. And because colonization is so much about the destruction of the structures and systems that support independence and decision making, decolonization needs to address autonomy and self-determination. So this sci-fi film, The Sixth World, shows a Navajo astronaut, Tesber Redhouse, on a mission to Mars. The story imagines what Navajo self-determination might look like in the future, and it's also about rethinking what technology might be used for. So Lindsay Catherine Cornham says about this, Indigenous futurism seeks to imagine different ways of relating to notions of progress and civilization. Advanced technologies are not finely tuned mechanisms of endless destruction. Advanced technologies should foster and improve human relationships with the non-human world. So in this story, humans, humanity's spiritual relationship with corn is the turning point of the story. So all of these new futurisms critique the assumption that society is progressing in a linear way towards an end point. This doesn't mean that racialized cultures are stuck in the past or outside of time, but that progress and futurity might look different. So in these depictions of the future, time might follow more of a cyclical path than a straight line. And so ultimately, all of these artists are challenging the myth of absence. They're saying that racialized people are here to stay, both now and into the future. And given the history and context of colonization and the cultural destruction in our past, I think that's a really powerful thing to say. Thanks.